this is what we're doing today. We're going to review this book, but first, welcome to the channel. Welcome back if you've been here before. I really do think a lot about all of you subscribers and anybody watching, commenting, sharing. It means a lot to me and that's because I, I really love people <laughs> and I'm a people person. So I do think about all of you, what you might like. Now, I've got some exciting news before we dive into this book. It's been exactly a year since I started the channel and I've been posting videos on gardening and I'm gonna keep doing that. Uh, and it's been every Friday, I'm gonna switch to Saturday mornings. So that's just gonna be a better time and we'll see how it goes. In addition, I'm going to start posting on Wednesdays sporadically, not every single Wednesday. I'm calling it Whimsical Wednesday because I'm being drawn to doing that and creating some content that is, and actually I'll call it content because in creating this content for all of you, it, it has also been for me. It is my contentment. It's my passion. Gardening is just creating in general. So I want to do some additional things that will probably have gardening woven into them, but not always. There'll be some writing, reading, some of my own work, maybe some singing and dancing because I come from a, an entertaining family. My mom was a, a jazz singer born in New Orleans and recorded on um, Capitol Records with, um, with Johnny Mercer and sang with Nat King Cole, recorded with him. So it's kind of the family legacy. Everybody's in the act, you know, <laughs> and I, I do like expressing that. So I will probably be doing some of that. I do have a theme song that I'd like to post fairly soon and a piece of poetry coming up. So look for that if you're interested in some additional just uh, entertainment, I guess. Okay, let's get down to the book. This was written by Sarah Wyndham Lewis. She's been a beekeeper since 2007 with her husband. And I picked it up just last week when I was at Rogers Gardens in uh, Newport Beach. And you, it, I did do a video on that. So you might want to look at that if you're interested in that garden. It's really a world-class garden. Fabulous. But this book caught my eye. I'm always looking for books to expand my library. I have a big library and uh, I, there seems to always be room for one more book. <laughs> Funny how that works. When I'm looking for a book, I always like to know who the author is, especially if it's a book that is giving me information that I think should be accurate. And she is a sustainable beekeeper. From what I have read of this, I haven't read the whole thing because I didn't read all the specific plants. I, I know plants pretty well, so I just scan that. But the information that she provides just generally with bees, things I never knew. It is fantastic, uh, the depth that she goes into, but she makes it very succinct. So it's a quick read, but it's a deep read. I knew that planting uh, natural wildflowers were good, but they aren't necessarily the ultimate for bees. I have learned from this book that it is better to plant trees and shrubs. I want to read to you some of the fun facts because I just, I couldn't memorize them all but I am really enamored with this book. Before I get to those fun facts, I'd like to show you some of the, or at least one of the illustrations in this book. This is indicative of the beautiful illustrations. They're just, that got me and the cover, you know, my cottage core self just went, I want that book. <laughs> I'm glad it's a good book because <laughs> that way I'll um, actually be able to use it, not just look at it on the shelf. So this, this particular chapter goes into um, what we can do even in small gardens, which is great because it can make a big difference depending on what you plant and where you plant it. Vertical planting is really a good thing, especially if it's a tree or a shrub, she says, because bees evolved in trees so they can get more food in a particular, in a smaller amount of space. And she says that the bees like the sun. I, I kind of knew that, um, but they really do because they need to stay warm. 
and also that they see blues and purples and whites more than the other colors. They can see the other colors except for red, I believe, that that it comes out as black. And we do need to plant for the four seasons because, if you can, because when it's above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, then the bees are active and they're out foraging or they're looking for water because they need water in the processing of their um, different functions in their life. I don't remember all of them. I'll try and find that in here and share it if I can find it. And the old fashioned flowers, of course, are great. I grow a lot of those for the bees. Okay, let's get down to the fun facts. Okay, she calls them remarkable facts about honeybees, and they are remarkable. Alrighty, try as I might to read without glasses. It just doesn't happen very often these days. Of an estimated 25,000 known species of bees worldwide, only seven species are honeybees. I'm not going to read all these to you. I'm just going to pick out the highlights that made me go, wow. They can forage within a three mile radius of their hive. They can fly farther afield, but the energy requirement diminishes um, the further they go away from the hive. And what they do is they will forage for one type of flower at a time. And then they get all that and pollen and the nectar, and then they go back to the hive. They don't go from one type to a different type of flower. Have you ever wondered what goes into a jar of honey? Honeybees will visit about 2 million flowers and fly around 80,000 kilometers, that's 50,000 miles, to make a one pound jar of honey. During its lifetime, a single foraging bee will collect enough ne nectar to make, wait for it, one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. Entire lifetime foraging for one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. I, I respect it and had gratitude for bees before, but I just really do now, even off the charts, love and respect for them. Wow. An individual honeybee visits 100 or more flowers in a single foraging trip. Unlike many other pollinators, honeybees will only forage on a single type of flower in any one trip. Flowers give off a positive electrical charge. Okay, I mean, I knew that flowers were, had seemed to have a nice vibration, but okay. She's saying that the flowers themselves give off a, a positive electrical charge for some time after being visited by a bee. And the bees also leave a chemical footprint. These and additional signals alert other pollinators not to bother visiting that bloom for nectar at that time. Year round, the bees keep the core hive temperature at between 32 degrees Celsius and 35 Celsius, that's 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In hot weather, they dispel heat by fanning their wings in winter, they isolate their flight muscles, giving them, using them to generate heat through shivering without wing motion. That's pretty amazing. Now, as having been a dancer, just a little aside in ballet, we learn how to isolate our muscles so that we can move an individual muscle. It is not easy to do and it takes a long time to learn it. So I'm amazed that in the short lifespan of these bees, that they just they can just do that right off the bat. It's pretty, or I assume it's right off the bat, or pretty soon into their life. They fly at about 15 to 20 miles an hour when they're on their way to get their food, and then it goes down to 12 miles an hour when they are returning and they're laden. Now it really starts to get interesting. These are things I just did not realize at all. Honeybees antennas detect sound and vibration and give them an amazing sense of smell, allowing them to detect specific forage sources up to a mile away. They also use them like cat's whiskers on a physical gauge of space. They navigate using a variety of means, including, okay, that's 
That's some kind of insect there. Including physical landmarks and positions of the sun, which their polarizing eyes allow them to see on a cloudy day. And a magnetoreceptor, mag magnetoreceptor? in their abdomen that senses the Earth's magnetic field. I knew that, but I didn't know how they did that. I still don't know much more than that, but it makes me want to know more. Scout bees locate sources of forage and return to the hive with samples to share. If the sample passes muster, the scout then communicates the source's whereabout with a waggle dance, uh, the direction, waggle dancing, the directions to their sisters. Bees do not hibernate. In autumn, the female worker, okay, All right. I gotta just, I gotta go back to this again. Bees do not hibernate. In autumn, the female workers throw the drones out of the hive to avoid feeding them through winter. The remaining, I'm not making any comment about this. The remaining colony clusters around the queen and will fly whenever the temperature, outside temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 10 degrees Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit. Okay, but, and I'm, I'm thinking, why, why did they do this? You know, I guess. I said I wasn't gonna comment, but I'm just gonna ask the question why. Number 21. Drones die in the process of mating, which takes place in flight. The queen makes just one nuptial trip in her lifetime. Isn't that beautifully said? A nuptial trip. She makes one nuptial trip in her lifetime, during the course of which she will mate with as many drones, or with many drones. I guess as many drones as possible is what I was thinking, but she says with many drones. She collects a lifetime supply of sperm, which she stores in her abdomen. Okay. If you knew this already, please just say so in the comments because I just would love to know how hopelessly lost I've been in this all this time. That's why I needed this book to get me up to speed. But wow, I didn't know that. This is really cool. I think I'd heard this before, but it's, it's definitely wonderful. Every queen has her own unique pheromone signature, which is spread throughout the hive from bee to bee amongst their many functions. Her pheromones act as a password so that intruder bees from other hives can quickly be recognized. Okay, those were the remarkable facts. And, uh, I'd love to know what you think. I, <laughs> I'm amazed. Really a beautiful book. And I hope you have a chance to look at it yourself because it's quite pretty and it feels good too. The pages are kind of matte finish. And I'll show you some more of the illustrations. Let me flip through this book for you so you can see, get an idea. Nice index, especially of plants. And in here is an illustration of a bee. After those remarkable facts. Some beehives. Just lovely and the list of of plants in it is very very good also has plants in here that are toxic or produce bad tasting honey so if that's important ah yes on that score okay she says that stargazers are in that list of toxic or producing uh, bad tasting honey i don't know which it is but mm, now i have a reason to cut my stargazer lilies and bring them inside because I always struggle. I don't know if you do that, but it's like, do I enjoy it in the garden or do I cut it and bring it inside and smell it? And I'll cut just like one little bloom or something and bring it inside. But now 
I'm gonna let them come to bud. I'm gonna cut them and bring them in. Any excuse to bring flowers inside, I'm gonna take it. Okay, <laughs> thanks again for joining me today. And if you look forward to having more gardening videos on Saturdays now, and then also these Whimsical Wednesday videos I'll be producing, um, let me know and ring the bell, whatever you wanna do. Until next time, keep dreaming and reading in the garden.